It's, it's exciting to be back here on the call. And just for folks uh, who are new, uh, <laughs> trying to learn about me, just a few sentences about me. Uh, two, two or two decades software engineering. I was never a good programmer. <laughs> was just trying to figure out, okay, how, and then uh, started to really orchestrate massive strategies uh, before uh, Fiducia, which is my own journey now. Spent 10 years uh, focused on data and AI. Uh, primarily built a 100 million business around data and AI, uh, very enterprise focus. And uh, Fiducia is a journey where we are totally different uh, experience and focus. And a lot of the things would reflect on some of the things that uh, we at Fiducia learned, uh, which ties very well into a lot of the things we discuss in Neurosystem. Uh, climate change, um, authenticity is important, uh, trusted storytelling, supply chain. I'll just walk through the index. There's a lot to cover. And also it's a different format. I never tried this format. This is a very new format where I want to have some interaction going while we start to understand this massive change that we're all uh, going to live through. And I, 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 this is a lot of the things that I'm saying is purely my view based on my interactions and exposures and how I'm looking at technology, the problems, and then uh, what is needed and the problems uh, we have to solve using these technologies too. So that would be the summary. But without, without further ado, well, uh, my name is Ganesh Harinath. I'm founder and CEO of Fiducia AI. But um, even more so, what's important is <laughs> I'm a founding member of uh, Enterprise Neurosystem, and it's a privilege always to be part of this ecosystem, and it's fantastic seeing you all today. So let me share my screen. I'll walk you through the index just to give you context uh, of the narrative, right? So that way, and I also want to pause at the end of uh, the index that way we know we, we align and then just we walk together so i'm minimizing a lot of these things that way but just seeing my screen uh, few things that i was actually reflecting on right now uh, climate change is real and that's one of the reasons why uh, neurosystem is neurosystem and uh, a lot of the work that we are going to do is continue to uh, would continue to impact uh, uh, make a huge impact is what i strongly believe what we are starting to learn in, through interaction is authenticity. When you actually touch a product, feel a project product, when it crosses countries, it's becoming even more trickier, uh, even in the United States, by the way. I'll reflect on some of the stories. What does it mean? We're working with a cooking oil company, very well-known brand, a piracy happens. Somebody copies the label and then sells it in the US market, right? This is all real, by the way. And trusted storytelling with, with uh, now even more so, which is so important, the generative AI. Look at the amount of content that we all can create, right? How can we trust all this content that is actually being created? Uh, and that's becoming super important. And consumers are really wanted to look at the trusted uh, the, the, these stories and also trust these stories to engage with the brand. And most importantly, supply chain, it's massive. It's, it's a chaos. Right? So a lot of these things are real. Uh, the enterprise neurosystem is playing a phenomenal role in climate change. And on today's call, the idea is how the physical and digital world are starting to converge even more. It was already converged, by the way. There were barcodes, right? The physical barcode uh, on any product almost. They scan. That's how inventory is done. When you go to a retail, retail checkout. But on the consumer side, we never used barcode to really understand what a product means. That's going to change very soon. RFIDs are embedded. Bacons are all over the place to try and understand what's happening in the consumer ecosystem. Smart labels are already there. So these are all unseen, invisible things, but there are some new trend setters which is actually helping converge the digital and physical world. What exactly convergence of digital and physical world mean? So today, if I hold a product, say for example, product and this is just physical and if i want to learn more it's kind of hard i have to go search look for i don't know if i'm looking at the, uh, the the right content and things like that this is one dimension the other dimension is uh, using uh, transducers uh, our own beehive project so what is that we are trying to do so we use a transducer to con convert uh, those frequencies and then try to apply ai and then start to learn while 
there's a lot of emphasis and focus on trying to understand the ecosystem and the impact of the climate change. The climate change is already real. And a lot of the things that we would be discussing today uh, would be uh, mitigation, right? Corrective actions. Uh, I wouldn't be able to cover all the different use cases and scenarios. This is very consumer centric. Uh, that is us, right? We as consumers, no doubt we have our jobs, we do. We are attached to enterprise. But most importantly, every citizen is a consumer, consumer of many things. And uh, uh, that's the change that we'll actually start to learn. And again, I just want to caution, this is primarily my view based on my past experiences uh, and uh, my interactions with, uh, with, with various organizations, uh, people, consumers, brands, and, and so on. And uh, anything that we do should actually work across phones, the scanners. Uh, scanners are super important. Uh, Head-mounted devices, this is changing. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen. Oculus Vision Pro is coming on its way, and there are many others uh, which actually gives immersive experience. Hologram, holographic billboards are becoming very, very common. I'll actually reflect on some of these things. A lot of the things that I'm saying right now will actually experience, see, look, and look at in some way, form, or fashion. Right? So, and then so the Web3 and uh, spatial web. Uh, People use different terminology, different dimensions. It's evolving. There's nothing solid. But what is real as we move move forward? And this is this is not even ten. I believe this is hundred x internet. Uh, uh, the technologies that actually are, are which are the platform for web three, the decentralization to power or support decentralization, blockchain coming into play, artificial intelligence, which is already there, right? Augmented reality, virtual reality, all these things converging together. It's it's just a it's one, it's 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 a, it's a it's gonna be a transformative change for all of us in the next 10 years. Two, it is, I believe this is going to be 10, 10x or 100 x the change that we lived through uh, while we started to experience internet. And uh, that is that is Web3. I'll, I'll briefly touch upon uh, the blockchain, how it is actually used in the uh, real world. Uh, some examples, uh, AI, we all know very, very well. Uh, AR, VR, I'll give you a taste of, okay, what, what these uh, technologies are. And uh, I have a list of use cases. I might not be able to go through each one of them, but at least I'll touch upon some of them. Uh, and I'm always available for a follow-up call or uh, approachable to, to discuss anything because these are exciting things i, I, I live i believe and uh, i would like to be part of it as well okay. so that's trying to i spent like fairly decent time 10 minutes to explain this but this is just to give you an idea in terms of uh, what we'll be walking through okay. i'll pause for a second and i'll actually i would like to take questions before i move forward as I said, this is a new format where I'll be switching between slides. You might like it, you might not like it, but please bear with me. But the in intent is for you to really uh, start to understand and connect all these things together. It's not about going deep into one technology, but it is about connecting all these dots with a purpose to solve some of the problems that we will be discussing a uh, little bit more in detail. Okay. Let me pause. Let me take at least one or two questions just to be sure that, okay, this is contextual and this is making sense. And I can always fine tune uh, the conversation. Any questions? Maybe Dinesh, you can help uh, reflect on. Uh, no, I think uh, it's uh, uh, like no. I, I don't have any questions at the current time, Ganesh. I right. think all the observations you are making are very valid. Um, I think, and this definitely is a very different way of presenting than going straight to a slide. So that's different, and that's nice. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I hope you like. We all like it, and yeah. then I'll, we'll, I'll take questions towards the end. And I, I'm, we can, I can please stop me anytime. This is not about just me saying something that I know. This is about learning together as well as what I strongly believe. Okay. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much. And then let's start with a very small uh, interaction. Only if you're comfortable and you're okay, please scan the QR code, which I'll actually start to highlight. But it's not about the QR code, but it's about the story behind the QR code, which is powered by multiple things. We'll walk through. Uh, and it's okay not to scan too, because I can actually flip the screen and then show the experience would look like. But if you scan, you can get a Louis Vuitton bag into your room. Right? That's the difference. And many of you would have done this. And uh, I myself, I'm doing it as I speak uh, so that I can, 
I can talk to. Well, yeah. This is this is this is where the world is headed. I'm not sure. I'm not saying exactly exactly uh, the way that you are actually looking at. So I'll tell you what is fascinating to me. So this bag. Sorry, let me switch to the. It's it's more exciting to see on the phone, uh, only because you can actually get it into in an AR mode into, into the room. Many of you have experienced it. For those especially who have not, uh, you might you might find it very very interesting. And I strongly believe that's where the world is actually headed. I'll cite some examples too. But when you look at this bag, this is not a static image anymore. And all the no, I wouldn't say all the content. A lot of the content that you would actually start to see moving forward is this. Uh, and uh, different people have different view. This is a three dimensional model, and uh, uh, I want to be very clear and vocal. It does not have to be a Vision Pro or an Oculus. Uh, this works on a phone. It looks very different. It's more immersive, engaging, and in few scenarios, it would actually make more sense. And I'll cite those examples to bring that into your environment. This is augmented reality, by the way. So this is uh, a real room. This is a real room. And then uh, what we are trying to do is you're trying to augment uh, the room with a digital experience, bringing a digital component, immersive digital component into the room. Right? That to me is fascinating. That's one. The second example that I would like to quote. Can I can I ask a question? Sure. I'm like uh, I know the screen is not showing the digital immersive experience probably oh, because of the joining the phone, uh, the phone. But I was just curious when you say immersive experience in a room. Yeah. Can you just describe or maybe elaborate on what that looks like? Because it's hard to visualize because on the phone it's just a purse, and you can. Oh no! At the bottom, it. at the bottom, uh, there's something called a VR experience, view in AR. Sorry, view in AR. If you scroll to the bottom, or maybe refresh and scroll to the bottom, when you scan it on a phone. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, you see a three-dimensional model, mm -hmm. and at the bottom you see a small button which actually says yeah. "View in AR." The moment you actually click "View in AR," uh, in few cases it would ask, ask for permission for the camera, and then suddenly the bag would actually show up in the room. Ah, okay, I see. So we, the phone, the bag gets overlaid with the room equipment and decor. Ah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, again, it is not about the QR code. QR code is a digital trigger, right? It is about the experience. The conversation is about the experience. So that experience can be triggered by an RFID. Uh, but what is fascinating is just imagine you are in a room and you want to really try to see if the sofa fits in here, which IKEA tries all the time, right? You can bring it into the room. Now where I'll tell you where I get excited. So when I want to try a watch and buy, Try-ons, right? That is AR experience. We can add capabilities on top of it to really try a Rolex watch, really try uh, 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 a dress, which is common uh, nowadays. Right? Uh, so you can just try it on. Maybe not exactly, but at least you know the colors and then how it actually looks on you and then so on. Sitting in your room, right? Sitting in your room. That's a big change. That's a big change. So on the surface, it doesn't appear, but as the world starts to embrace this, the 3D images and making it available, see, what is important, the way how I think, uh, at least is, it has to work on something which everybody has access to, not the head-mounted device. That's going to take a long time, right? So it has to work on the phone. So at least at Fiducia, what we think and do is we, we want to make it work on the phone and in the browser. That way, the friction is gone. And then add these experiences. It could be different, a gamification, right? A gamification in your room. But, and, and you'll see what is fascinating. The same experience, right? It looks differently on the desktop. What we are look, looking at, the screen is very, very flat. It's very two-dimensional. Let me see how, okay. very two-dimensional, but uh, in the room, it is very three-dimensional. Now, just imagine the URL, if you plug into Oculus, it's going to be there, right there, super immersive, right? That's another story that I wanted to share. So, while, uh, while the, let me, 
Let me no. okay. I'll switch to something else and then I'll continue to talk. Is, is, uh, did I answer your question, Dinesh? And I'll be sharing some of these links. I mean, no, yes, you did. Like, no, um, I'm I'm curious as it goes out. I, I think you did give one example that um, having this type of immersive digital thing for the furniture, you could see what, where the thing fits or not, or what it looks like that. But apart from furniture, like, no, uh, and even like, as we're doing, say the bag, the bag in a, my environment, I want to have the bag on my shoulder or my wife actually. Yeah. Yeah. Person wants to have the person, the shoulder, yeah. or want to match it against different clothes. Yeah. So it wasn't quite clear to me, uh, like, you know, how the simple AR would enable that type of yeah. uh, capability. Does it do that, or is it more like still left to the imagination? Uh, we need to add layers. Fiducia is uh, exploring at this point in time to bring in those additional layers. But the basic prerequisite is the three-dimensional model. It could be three-dimensional model of anything, uh, right? And try on is a concept. Try on, uh, trying it on the hand, the hand. So this is where AI come, comes into play, right? Body tracking. So the camera is tracking the body and it, it is actually detecting the hand and it actually knows where exactly the hand is. And that's the power of AI that would actually sit, uh, right? In, in, nowadays, in the, in the browser, by the way, in the, in the browser, it is actually making all these things happen. And computer vision comes into play. And mm -hmm. body tracking happens. And then it layers the, the, the watch on your hand. Right? It's a simple example. Then a, a, a dress or a purse. Watch on a hand. Okay, you're looking at the phone. You're layering it on your hand. Uh, but there are, there are two, three layers that we would have to build on top of what we have. Okay. Uh, to take this AR into trions, mm -hmm. and the, the moment, uh, even building AR, there's a lot of uh, AI involved. I'll touch upon that very briefly, uh, right after I've answered Dinesh's question. But Dinesh, your point is very valid. So taking this to the next level is, is called trions, mm -hmm. and Patricia is very actively working on uh, turning on trions. Mm -hmm. And now I want to reflect an engineering point. Right. In the past, all these things we have to build up foundational. In today's world, a uh, lot of these things that we are discussing are API calls. Right? Uh, we, we are exploring what are the three APIs that we can actually call uh, to make that make trions happen. It might have it might have some JavaScript libraries, or, and it might have to make some API calls. But those trions would actually work. Then Fiducia bringing uh, building the round up, and what does it translate to? It translates to when you look at any organization, they are like two broad categories. One, who are going very deep and solving a lot of the problem. To really turn on try on is a very deep problem that is actually solved by some uh, someone. And uh, uh, Fiducia, many companies like Fiducia, we actually try to use these services as libraries or API calls uh, to activate these capabilities to solve a problem, right? So platform versus solving a problem. Uh, uh, makes sense. Makes sense. To me. Yeah. Yep. Now let me expand the screen. So uh, this is an immersive version. So the web would start to look like this, uh, by the way, and it's very hard to put a timetable on what we are looking at right now and when this would happen. But the question is. Uh, is the world ready to actually start to act on it? Yes, but it's a matter of investments. Which brands would actually start to invest in some of these things? And uh, to me, I'll tell you what is fascinating. Same story. What we are seeing here would actually work on a phone. It will look slightly different, but it would be the same experience. And uh, I'll, I'll touch upon some of the components here and uh, explain how easy it is in today's world to really create an experience like this. And this is an experience that we built for uh, Coke Europe, uh, and it took uh, less than 30 minutes. That's about it. it was just, and I'll tell you how, how all these things can happen. But what is fascinating to me, it works on the phone. It works on the desktop uh, that you're actually seeing. It works on a head-mounted device. When you wear a head-mounted device, that is just stunning. You're like there in the room. You're walking around. And uh, that, is, that is the new web. That is the new web. And uh, everybody is actually trying to figure out how to actually make this accessible, make these experiences accessible, and tell these stories, uh, compelling stories. And uh, I'll tell you where I get excited. So these stories 
translate to efficiencies. Those efficiencies translate to uh, a part in climate change, right? See how all these things are interconnected. That's how I look at it. So what are the components here? So this is already a digital world. And then in this digital world, you can all have another digital trigger to get it into your room, not on the screen, but into your room. Those are the QR codes. And this images, like happy people having Coke. You know who did this? It would have taken a team, right? A real people, a camera, multiple shots, fine tuning it, multiple days. This is just one liner in a service called Mid Journey, just like Chat, Chat, Chat GPT and Dali, if you're familiar with, which actually generates image. Mid Journey is very focused on converting text to images. I said, uh, happy Gen Z uh, drinking Coke in Europe. That's about it. It took less than 15 seconds to get an image. You just slap it on. How easy it is to slap it on. In the past, uh, if you have to work with images and then you get the images and then you do all this web uh, changes and then so on. But now, so let me see it, uh, one second. I, okay, I can move this. Now say for example, oh, you know what? I want to create a Christmas experience and I want to just change the setting. I can create a new one, but just for conversation. Now, yeah, you know what? Oh, I want to get a wine bottle into the room. What I, clicked, what I did is I clicked on a three-dimensional bottle uh, of a Robert Mondavi wine. That's about it. You bring it here. Oh, this is great. I want to put it on a pedestal. Okay, I put it on a pedestal. So, so look at look at how simple how simple it is. And this is this is what is fascinating. By the way, this has got nothing to do with fiducia. It's got nothing to do with the the discussion that we are actually having is. The web, the two dimensional web is changing. It's fast changing and we all will actually start to see. But why do I use the term 10X or 100X? In the past to create a web page, it even now it, it takes a lot of time, but imagine an immersive setting. Click, click and click, that's about it. You can walk around the room. Oh, I was excited to bring in the 3D model that you actually saw on the phone. The same Louis Vuitton bag here, it's the exact same object. And this format is called GLB. Uh, USDZ is very uh, Apple specific format. GLB is very generic format, which actually is supported by many of these immersive platform. By the way, the platform that we are looking at right now is Spatial. Uh, we just have an account on Spatial. That's about it. And uh, let me, yeah, we're we good so far. Any, any questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, like um, Ganesh, I see the um, the ease at which uh, these three dimensional things are being done. Yeah, and uh, definitely that ease is great that people would be able to create this type of interactive interaction. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, no, I mean, uh, this usability in the three D, the usability in the view. Yeah, what does it trigger? How does it impact or change what we're doing? Because in the sense. Like, no, I see a room, we see the room and we are still interacting with, so I'm just trying to uh, see, okay, so how does it, what does it mean for people and society and what changes would this type of having a different yeah. experience, uh, what would it make difference or make uh, easy, which say the current 2D uh, virtual yeah. interactions does not. And I'm a little bit struggling, so I was wondering if you can elaborate on that. No, very, very, very good point. Very good point, Danish. So a lot of the things that we are actually looking at uh, opportunities from consumer perspective, right? Now let's switch, flip a little bit on the enterprise side. I'll give you one or two examples there. So one example, oh, you know what? We're all talking about a Boeing engine. We are in like five different rooms. We are on, on a call, on a Zoom call. Okay. Imagine a Boeing three-dimensional, uh, sorry, Boeing engine three-dimensional model into the room or a G three-dimensional engine, big engine into the room where you can zoom in and then see where you can actually change certain parameters and then actually start to see and that is real. Today, that is real. so this is a very consumer specific view mm -hmm. and there can be a lot of stories, gamification and things like that. This is very Gen Z centric. 
uh, storytelling and how the world is changing for, for the foreseeable future for generations to come. They would not touch the web. They would straight come here and then actually walk into a store. Instead of this setting, it would be a store. It could be a Walmart store. You just walk around the aisle or look for and then go straight there. Right? So that is very consumer centric. But let's pause that for a second. Now, the second example that I can actually give is, you know what, we are doing uh, constructional design mm -hmm. and we want to actually bring in a 3D model and make some changes to that in, uh, interactively. People in different location are trying to give their views and then making some small changes and then seeing the impact and then so on. These are the things that we would all start to see. It, it would work, these experiences would work on the desktop, just like how we are actually seeing. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be even more stunning and real when you wear something like this, the head-mounted set. I'm still not very, very attached to head-mounted sets yet, uh, because it's very intense on our eye. We can't, we, we can we can stare at the screen for the whole day, but it's very hard to really look into a head-mounted set. Head-mounted set, at least at this point in time, that's going to change over a period of time. That's going to change. Uh, but those are. Those are, uh, that's, I believe that is real, that is real. And the, the third example that I would actually like to give is, uh, say for example, uh, uh, even, even uh, in the medical uh, healthcare industry, uh, you want to do a procedure. Imagine it's on a, on a, on a three-dimensional model. It has all the mechanics to respond to a lot of the things that you actually do. You, 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 and I believe all those things would actually become very common in years to come. And it's very hard to put a timetable on that. Yeah. Hope, hope, hope that clarifies uh, some of the very important uh, question that you asked. Yeah, no, no, I think I get it. Like, you know, you've given quite a few examples where the 3D interaction would be way superior than having a 2D interaction. <laughs> and one can find more examples in both enterprise domain and in the consumer domain. That's true. That's true. Now, the third, people talk about blockchain, right? I'll just spend a few minutes and then we'll go through some of the use cases. Uh, right after this, I'll pause and then I'll take some questions and then we can pick and choose some of the use cases and then discuss through. That way, we know we stitch all these things together and solve some problems too, right? People talk about blockchain and blockchain has become synonymous to cryptocurrency. Uh, for, for reasons, and that's nothing but it is one of the many applications on blockchain. And it turned out to be the first application. It's fascinating change. Uh, moving $100,000 from point A to point B is just frictionless today. Frictionless. And this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. It, it has its own risks. People are trying to understand. But one thing that I would like to share, this is both from personal experiences both from the technology perspective and also from a user perspective too, right? Uh, crypto is nothing but, an, but one application. Uh, blockchain is fascinating to me because uh, store, just let's forget everything. Storage as service to suddenly decentralize storage as a service to anybody, anywhere in the world using a simple wallet. So what, what exactly is happening, the mechanics behind blockchain? Not going into the nitty gritty details of, okay, Ethereum works this way and uh, it's layer one. Polygon is uh, layer two, layered on top of Ethereum and it's optimized. And, uh, one, uh, I'm, I'm still learning too. Uh, I'll come back with the right language and then we can have more detailed discussions around it. But I'll tell you why it is fascinating. Web3 is all about decentralization and the foundation, one of the foundation block uh, is blockchain and will continue to be blockchain. What we have seen is experiences. Now suddenly we are actually seeing trust. I believe it, it's not countries anymore. It is globe. When we do something, it actually impacts a globe. When a product, we, when, our, when we are consuming a product, it does not have to happen to be produced or manufactured here. It can actually, and that's we, we all we already see that. Right? But how can you make this secure? How can you make this efficient? Right? A lot of the things would actually be answered. And I'll reflect on some of the examples too. And this is where authenticity is important. And let's uh, I mean, let's discuss the authenticity use case and also uh, the way how I see how the world would actually change for the foreseeable future. Right? 
NFT is just, it's, it's, it's simpler than what we actually think. Right? Uh, what we are looking at is a non-tradable NFT. We socialize and we discuss non-tradable NFT. So what exactly non-tradable NFT is? It's, it's nothing but you take a content and write it. And that writing it is being done through a contract. So what needs to happen? A contract is sitting on a blockchain. And then this contract, you clearly say, you give me an image and then, okay, I know what to do. Oh, I know only two people can actually exchange uh, exchange this content, whatever that is, right? And these are rules. You can actually mention these rules in, uh, in the contract or the document. And that that's foundational, that gets uh, written. And what you're looking at is, this is a real NFT, by the way. Let me, uh, let's see, which one makes sense, okay. And I'll, I'll try to give more meaningful examples too as we connect, uh, continue, but very quickly, very briefly. So this is a three-dimensional model. And this is a three-dimensional NFT, which is minted using Fiducia platform. One click, that's about it. Upload a three-dimensional image uh, NFT. It hit the contract and the contract says, okay, this is non-tradable and that's how the contract has been written. And uh, it is published or listed on OpenSea, right? So, uh, so blockchain, this is the content. So this is the content which is tied to the contract and it is published um, on OpenSea. Many of them, as we already know OpenSea where all these NFTs are listed. Uh, tradable NFTs, and you can actually, it's nothing but it's displaying a format, that's about it. You, a lot of it is uh, bound by the contract uh, that is powering this. OpenSea is nothing but a view into an NFT, that is not the NFT. It, it is not even uh, a store of an NFT, it is just a view. The actual contract is sitting on, in this case, Polygon, a blockchain. Actual content uh, is sitting on IPFS, totally uh, separate store outside. So these topics are slightly deeper, uh, but the summary that I wanted to actually share is uh, blockchain is really not about crypto. This crypto is just one out of the many uh, scenarios or use cases for blockchain. Right? Uh, NFTs, uh, it's not about NFT. It is about how we want to use the blockchain framework uh, to solve problems. And one of the example uh, here is authenticity. We'll reflect on that very soon. I'm, I'm, I'm watching time too. So but we'll go back and together we'll, we can pick on two or three uh, scenarios. We may not be able to run through all the scenarios, but we'll carefully pick, which encompasses a lot of these things. But what is the story around NFT here? Uh, to really validate the authenticity of product uh, uh, NFT, can be used, I'm not saying should be used, can be used. The digital coupons that we actually uh, use to get the discounts and so on would be replaced and could be replaced by uh, non-tradable NFTs. It's not that you can actually increase the dollar value of the NFT and start to trade, uh, but you can write a contract in such a way that you can exchange for value only with the brand, right? That's nothing but a contract. And those changes are about to come. Uh, authenticity is so important. When we are looking at a video, we don't even know today right, if it is real or if it is fake. How do we know? Uh, frameworks like blockchain would actually be used to put a fingerprint saying that, yeah, this is real. Right? And again, a lot of the things that I'm sharing is primarily my view, my view, connecting technology uh, and uh, some of the issues uh, that we see day in, day out, and some of the issues that we want, we all want to participate and then take all these things together to solve the problems. I'll, I'll pause here. So this is a little overview about, uh, we saw AR, we saw VR, AI we all know very, very well. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, three-dimensional models, it used to take at least one person working almost for two days to really build a three-dimensional model with 30 pictures today. There are apps, primarily uh, computer vision behind the scene. You, know, you actually you roll the camera and within two minutes, you, you would not have like the 100% perfect enterprise grade 3D model, but 90%. And uh, from experience, one and a half year ago, one person's you know, stitching 
25 images together to build a 3D module. Look how, how all these all these capabilities are actually coming together very, very well. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll share this uh, uh, editorial, very recent editorial. Only if interested, you can actually go back and then take a look at it. So one last video that I'm going to play, uh, you can, can be clicked from here. Uh, hologram billboards are actually becoming very common. Uh, I'll just play it for just one second and share the link. Uh, let me play. Then I'll, I'll stop the music. So, uh, sorry, this format might be very disturbing for many of you. Sorry about that. I'm doing my best. Uh, so, the same, no change. No change in content, no change in URL. This is a hologram billboard that is becoming very common. And uh, I was at an event, Verizon event, uh, at the Chase Warrior Stadium, a holo proto hologram billboard. They just plugged in the URL, and that's about it. That's what that's what you saw. I'll share the link. It's it's exact. It's more immersive, right? More immersive. So the 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 display capabilities. Let me close this, please. So the display capabilities, I'll go back to the slide, sorry. I'll say a few words uh, around the slide, and then we'll go back to some of these use cases. So the display capabilities, just to finish the thought, the display capabilities uh, of the three-dimensional model, right, where it can be displayed, it is just changing by the way. New, new, new display units are coming, the head-mounted devices, those billboards are going to change. Uh, to hologram billboards to give these immersive experiences uh, on the phone you can actually experience uh, but the undercurrent the fascinating under undercurrent is it is just one format uh, which is just going to start to transform but when i say format it is not about the glb format it is about uh, a three-dimensional format of all these objects uh, it's going to disrupt both the consumer world and also uh, uh, the enterprise world in a very very big way yeah. uh, this is the only slide that I had in mind, just to summarize all these thoughts before we uh, run through some use cases. Right? So a lot of the things that we have discussed is reflected in some, some way, form or fashion. This is the simplest way how I could really come together and then say, uh, this is more around retail. We can, on the right, if you just remove everything and then just put some enterprise use cases and that's how the word is going to be. The platform, the blockchain, we are not going to, uh, ideally, we don't want to. The moment you actually start to build a blockchain platform, the decentralization part is gone, by the way. Right? People talk about private blockchain and all that. Uh, we can rather use a database uh, than using a private blockchain. So uh, public blockchain uh, is for real, for the possible future. Augmented reality, bringing something into your room is real. Uh, virtual reality, creating a new world, immersive experience is real. Right, that is happening. Generative AI or AI overall, uh, and uh, it's, it's it's such a blessing to be in era where uh, big technologies, right? Not just three. There are many going on. Many technologies um, evolving to a maturity level where we can actually start to build solutions. And that's where, when you start to look at the broad category of companies, there will be companies who will be actually going and solving these problems deep and making it very very simple and easy for others. And companies like uh, small companies like Fidusha, which, which can pay subscription fees and then start to hit some of these APIs to make it happen. Right? Uh, Adobe, uh, stunning. I don't know if they have APIs. Uh, uh, content creation, Mid Journey, I have shown. Uh, uh, but everything is a service. Authenticity is a service. And authenticity service would be actually powered by content, a three dimensional model, and also blockchain. All right, that will be stitched behind the scene, which would interact with some of these very broad uh, technology frameworks or platforms. Yeah. So I'll, I'll pause here. And, uh, Ganesh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Ganesh, this is Ravi. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question I think probably Dinesh also had in the beginning, as he said that he is trying to map it to the real use case and how exactly it can be a uh, uh, value add to the industry. If I take a case, just take a case of retail. 
Yeah. In in case of retail, if I am uh, the president of the support JC Penny or Messi's, and I wanted to to have that user experience, yeah, where my uh, customers can go and can have a three D experience, and if I wanted to uh, upgrade my platforms to do that, how exactly uh, Fiducia can help? Because based on this particular uh, framework or the slide you're showing, like uh, I need to take control of my front end and at least I need to have my content, my catalogs and all those things are arranged as per the format supported yeah. by uh, 3D experience. And then Fiducia can go and have the back end uh, or some part of it, including blockchain, special web, AR, VR and generative AI. Is that is my assumption right, or is it something addition to that? No, I think what you said is right, Ravi. There is no no uh, uh, simple, straightforward answer, at least at this point in time. But the way how it would be approached, uh, this is what I believe, right? So there are already content management systems. Now you'll actually start to see a lot of three D based content management system. Right? Yes. Now, uh, then powered by AI, right? So say, for example, if I'm a user and if I am looking for uh, a watch with specific attributes, I actually express myself and it has to go look for, right? It, use, it, it would use generative AI and then pick those uh, 3D models, which are more relevant and then which, will, uh, which can be presented. What I've said right now is just on the fly to the question that you asked, but all, uh, there are few systems that are already there. A few systems would continue to evolve. One system that I see, right, to support all this content is uh, content management system and content distribution system. Now, I mean, especially since you are in center of 5G and 6G, 5G and 6G is needed. And I'll tell you why. The image uh, is 2K, 5K, 7K, 10K. The video can be 3MB, 5MB, but it can be streamed. But you can't you can't stream a six GB or six sorry six MB twenty MB fifty MB three dimensional models into the room. It has to be cached. It has to be served, right? And uh, it's fascinating to see how five G is already there and the six G is starting to evolve too. And uh, these things have have to come together for all these things to be real. Because what you download it is like a six uh, MB. Uh, file. It would have taken a little longer, depending upon the phone that you actually used, and consumer experiences. This, this there would there would be and could be friction. So what Fiducia does is, okay, how can I optimize this content? What else can I do to optimize and help retail? Right? So, so there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, it has to come together, and there are many companies like Fiducia would continue to work to really make this remove friction. So what are we doing? We are solving problems by removing some of this friction. Uh, and enabling capabilities uh, for primarily the, the retail world. Same thing can be applied for uh, the enterprise world. Yeah, I hope I hope I answered the question. Uh, um, sorry. Yeah, Ganesh, I think uh, definitely, but I think it's still one question is still there. I think based on the time, please feel sure. free to skip it. Sure. But uh, being uh, uh, the head of any organizations who are there for a strategy or a business development and all, yeah. how exactly you will convince uh, what Fiducia can do in this space along with their existing uh, infrastructure and framework, how exactly uh, this user experience can be achieved with your help? And addition to that, what else is needed? I think anybody who is sitting in that area yeah, I'll be looking for those answers as well, Ganesh. Thank you. No, no, definitely. It's a good question. I'll try do my best to keep it short. Um, uh, CMOs are empowered to actually bring the brand from multiple dimensions, both from product security perspective, storytelling perspective. Right? They're empowered. Right? We are looking for opportunities to see if we can actually engage them. Then the brand marketing agencies, they want to tell these exciting stories and they are trying to figure out what are the new mediums, how we can actually start to engage? And also I get challenged, by the way, I get challenged many times. Who is going to really see this immersive experience? A lot of it depends upon the demographics, right? Uh, the brands are starting to look, how can I attract these younger generations to really start to believe us, look at us, uh, experience us? And their view of uh, looking at the world, my kids look at the world very differently than I do, all right? 
And interestingly, I have a lot of conversations with them to learn to see how uh, how these transformations have to be applied as well. So uh, when we build solution, it is uh, when it is not going back, it has to be now and uh, forward. Moving forward, not many many people have seen how the future would actually look like, and that's where we all have to come together, and then we can have our own lens, start to share our views and opinions, see what's possible, factor in uh, factor in the real next generation folks to see how they view the world and make it possible. <laughs> yeah. So the CMOs, uh, brand marketing within organizations, and brand marketing agencies are the people that we aspire to connect. It's very hard, by the way. Uh, this is this is great, this is fascinating, but I'll tell you the ground truth, really go and convince because everybody, they're chasing some, to solve something immediate. I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. Sorry, Ravi. <laughs> I can- No, no, thanks, Ganesh, thanks, Ganesh. No, 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 that is good, that is good. So there are many, uh, but I'll start with a very simple use case. And uh, so, so this is the section that I'm just focused on. This is nothing but my talk track. So I'm just going back and then just wanted to be sure that I am. I'll be sharing a lot of this information. I'll put it in a document and send it out. And this one, I can't take the name of the brand, but this is real. Very well known cooking oil brand, uh, which exports from India to 50 countries. They do 200,000 liters every day. In the US, the label is copied and sold for 25% less. If I wouldn't have, if I would have been engaged, I, I couldn't even have told the story the way how I said in two lines, and that is real. And uh, and this is going to be uh, even more so in the future. And how do you how do you protect the physical products? So this the story here is to really bring in digital capabilities, converge it with the physical products to protect the product authenticity. Cooking oil is not exciting, but to me it is still exciting, I'll tell you why. We consume day in, day out. If that is wrong for some reason, that's not a good thing. It's very, very unsafe environment. And that's the environment that we're all in, by the way. And uh, that's where, the, as the awareness increase, then checks and balances become important. Uh, if we don't know, we don't know. And these things will actually start to surface more and more. And how, how could some of these things that we discussed would actually solve? Uh, a digital trigger would make uh, information easily accessible and immediately. That has to be connected with product. I, want, I don't want to go into the details of how this is solved. We can have a conversation, separate conversation. We're in a very exploratory phase to try and help some of these brands. Uh, and those triggers, those triggers have to be serialized. So if you copy, how many, how many, how many labels would people would how many labels people would actually come? Then put a geofence when a shipment comes in. It comes in only and should be sold only in California. And suddenly you see a scan somewhere else, meaning somebody is actually copied. Okay, one or two is fine. Fifty scans, but who are scanning? And that's where awareness comes into play. So when we become suspicious, we don't know where to go today. But when we become suspicious, very soon we know how to get to the information. And that's the problem that we all have to solve. I'm not saying it is solved or Fiducia has solved it, but we have to solve. We have to figure out ways to solve. Okay. I'll park there. Uh, oh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, page you have up here is very interesting because you know so much is written about oh you know blockchain uh, uses a lot of energy, uh, but the points you have here about well you know, reducing food waste and improving supply chain efficiency, uh, which uh, actually uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> so these these things counteract, you know, they could very well counteract uh, any increase in, uh, in emissions caused by use of blockchain, right? So, I mean, Looking at the problem from a total perspective, uh, you know, this can be uh, a net benefit, right? No, definitely, definitely. And sometimes it's very hard to tie all these things together and start to feel realized and then start to march on it, right? 
The last three things, if the brand start to pay utmost attention and then the attention, because everything requires investment, but they, they themselves see, because wastage is reduced. If the brand is telling good stories, supply chain problems for themselves are solved, they, they are cost optimizing whatever they are doing as well. Right? So there is benefit for everybody, but uh, it's super important <laughs> to end uh, yeah, we're all learning. We're all learning. We'll continue to learn. <laughs> now, thanks for the comments there, uh, Sanjay. Uh, we have discussed about the AR experiences. Endless aisle, and this number is real, by the way. 25% uh, in retail is shrinkage. I actually learned through having a conversation with somebody at Salesforce. Said, uh, I said, what is a, what is what is the percentage? Shrinkage is nothing but uh, products disappearing from store, physical stores, uh, um, by employees, by consumer, uh, by people who are walking into the stores. All right, and that is real. It's a big number, twenty to twenty-five percent. That's a large number. Ganesh, is it twenty to twenty-five percent for all uh, good of perishable goods? But sounds oh, rather high for something like a Coke can or a it's, product. Is it that high? It's more for the retail. Uh, re, uh, okay, sorry. Re, uh, retail is C CPG is consumer packaged goods. Uh -huh. uh, retail, I would actually say, a simple definition is a non consumable things that we use almost uh, daily or for our users, right? Uh -huh. That is retail. So, a lot of the stories actually, I should have said this in the beginning CPG plus retail. The oil use case is a CPG use case, right? Uh, a Prada use case is, um, or uh, say for example, a watch in a store, that's a retail use case. Okay. Good point, Dinesh, good point. So uh, it's not as much in the CPG space, but it is more in the broader retail space. Right? Clothing, you take clothing, watch, and other things. Uh, and uh, okay, I want to be respectful of time. I'll say last one sentence, uh, then open up floor for question. I can just stay back uh, as now, but uh, there are many things that I would like to share, but I'll put this in a document and send it out. Uh, GS1, the barcode that you actually see, and uh, we are very close to 2024. 2027, that becomes a QR code. And uh, you'll start to see QR codes everywhere. So, so what is the problem that is solving? Today, uh, those barcodes can be scanned only through scanners at the retail, which is used for checkout. But what's fascinating is the same QR code can be used for a checkout by in a retail store. But when you scan, it is expected the brand start to tell their stories, right? How would they tell their stories and how can they make it authentic? It's a great opportunity for the brands to start to think differently and then uh, build capabilities to tell authentic stories, depending upon the brand, tell immersive stories too. And uh, the rest is, those numbers are uh, great. I mean, I, it's from very valid sources, even if not to the T, but I'm sure it should, it's pretty, pretty close. But a lot of the things that we have discussed is real, but it's also a fantastic opportunity for all of us to start to look into the future and, uh, and uh, bring in those big changes. So with that, uh, I pause and uh, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity today here uh, to share my view uh, experiences. And uh, some of my advisors are there on the call, uh, and my own team member, Jonathan Taylor, is on the call too. But what I shared is not just me working with uh, with folks within Pidusha and outside.